what I would like to do for the next few minutes is talk about how we are using, harnessing AI to create a better world. And I want to both educate and challenge your thinking. And so there's no question that most of you in the room, BAPS and students, know this graphic. It's very, very deep. For those of you who don't, this is United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In 2015, the UN defined these 17 themes, each one denoted by a block, with the intention that by the end of 2030, the underlying 169 targets would be achieved. The cold hard truth is that we are nowhere close. Nobel laureates and other experts will tell us that the earliest we're going to achieve some of these goals is in 2080. Okay? And others at this point are not attainable. And I think it's not too hard to disagree with me to say that is just not acceptable. We do not want to live in a world where we are not making progress against these critical sustainable goals. And so as someone who has spent an entire career bringing frontier innovations to the world to solve what were considered to be very challenging problems, I believe we have the opportunity to reconsider and reframe our approach. This to reframe our approach so that we can begin to make progress. And so what I'd like to do for our time together is talk about how we are accomplishing incredibly difficult challenges through the lens of only one of these 17 SDGs. Okay? And that one happens to be healthcare. And I chose that one because I thought it might be the most universally appreciated of all of the 17 because we're all concerned about our health. Now, I didn't choose healthcare because it is a layup. Healthcare system is in deep crisis. Some really critical facts to understand. We are seeing a dramatically aging population globally. One in every eight people on the planet are medically obese. The, the mental health challenges that permeate the world today are growing. Last year, 50,000 Americans a record committed suicide. All of these different challenges are putting a lot of burden on the healthcare system. But unfortunately, our healthcare providers today are suffering from burnout and anxiety at record levels. And as a result of that, they are leaving the profession. So the irony is, we need more healthcare workers, but yet what the World Health Organization tells us is we will be at least 10 million healthcare workers short by the end of this decade. And that's just not acceptable. And of course, the costs continue to spiral out of control. And, and so, so we have now at our disposal, for the first time, which is accessible to all of us, a multi-purpose platform that I'd liken to a Swiss Army knife on steroids. And that, in fact, is something that has a limitless number of tools that can solve problems that we could never solve before at rates of speed that were unimaginable. Now, I recognize, and the media has done a brilliant job of putting a lot of fear into many people's hearts about the downside of AI. And I think it's important to understand that a lot of this is just overblown. But more importantly, I want to share with you an immutable truth. And that is no technology is inherently good or bad. Technology is only as good as the values and the intentions of the people who deploy it. And it is with those values and intentions that we will collectively create our future together. So let us leave it to the policymakers and the regulators to manage the downside risks of AI and leave it to us, the leaders, who care about living in a better world to harness AI for good. Now, I want to offer you four specific proof points to demonstrate why I believe this is so powerful. And first, though, we need to go back to the very center of the healthcare system, the medical doctor. 
Now, the medical doctor, as you can see in this image, is under incredible stress. A lot of these doctors who are leaving the profession, and I've had many in my MBA classrooms have said, Professor Mike, you know, I spend one hour in the operating room and four hours doing paperwork. I'm a cog in the healthcare industrial complex, and I do not feel like I am doing what I wanted to do. And so what we see here is someone who is, they're, they're spending too much time doing battle with insurance companies around compliance. And one of the unintended consequences of the mass adoption of electronic medical records is that doctors have become note takers. They spend on average four hours every single day entering notes into these health records. It's crazy. So when a doctor receives their degree and they're ready to practice, they take the Hippocratic Oath. And the Hippocratic Oath is first, do no harm. But unfortunately, burned out doctors are doing harm. Of course, not intentional harm. But we see 800,000 Americans die every single year from medical errors, another 4,000 from surgical errors. And this just cannot continue. So how do we ease the pain of these clinicians so they can, in turn, ease our pain? And I very much believe, and I hope that the next few examples will prove, that bringing an AI-enabled physician's assistant to the clinical team will be very, very powerful. And so I'm not saying that we're going to forfeit medical care to an AI bot. That's not at all what I'm saying. But there are many, many examples, and I'm only going to get to scratch the surface in this short talk, about how we're using AI to remove the administrative burden and the cognitive burden on doctors. And at the same time, a lot of very early promise about how AI is leading to a much more better clinical outcome. So what you see here is something that I know some of you in this room have experienced. Now, for most of us, when you think about a consultation with the doctor, right? It's like a drive-by, okay? They're racing from appointment to appointment. And more often than not, they're sitting at a bench and they're typing, but they're looking into a computer screen. They're looking at your record. And they're looking over their shoulder at you every you know, 15, 30 seconds to keep you engaged. Well, what we have now is an AI-enabled medical scribe, an ambient scribe. And what happens is that the doctor is now in consultation with the patient. That discussion is being recorded. That video file is being translated into a text file. That text file is being uploaded into the electronic, electronic medical record of the patient. And then you can print a summary of that discussion and hand it to the patient as they leave the room. Okay? This is saving medical professionals 20 plus hours a week. So the early feedback from doctors is extremely positive. Imagine what you can do with 20 extra hours a week in your lives. And so what we're seeing is doctors now have more time to provide a higher quality of care to patients, more time to keep up with their medical journals, and oh yeah, go home and recuperate and rejuvenate so that you can manage that systemic challenge, which is burnout. So that's proof point number one. We have paid a lot of lip service in this country to preventative care, but that's not how we roll in America. Okay? The way we roll is someone becomes symptomatic and you go see a doctor about a challenge that you're facing, hopefully with enough time to alleviate that problem. Now we're starting to see AI-enabled solutions that can predict well in advance of significant illnesses and diseases. And so one of them comes from a company called Lucent Technologies, working very closely with the Mayo Clinic. And, there, and this one is focused on diabetes. 40% of Americans have prediabetes. 80% don't know it. Diabetes costs the US healthcare system a half a trillion dollars a year. That's with a T, okay? And of course, people with diabetes live lives with a lot of challenges. And so it turns out diabetes is hiding in plain sight. And these algorithms are able to detect from your medical record whether you are actually on track to have diabetes. And the physician can then do an intervention and put you on an appropriate medical regimen to ensure that you don't cross that threshold, making countless lives far more pleasant to live and saving the healthcare system massive amounts of money. 
The third proof point is around accuracy of detection. One of the things that I want to share with the audience, especially with the younger ones in the room, and this is to educate but not to scare people, the number of incidences of cancer amongst people in the age cohort from 19 to 49 is rising dramatically, especially instances of gastrointestinal cancers. And many of you, I'm sure, saw on the news yesterday that Princess Kate, the Princess of Wales, reported that she has cancer, right? And this was after a very severe abdominal surgery. And so it's very likely it's, it's a gastrointestinal cancer. And so what you find is that when you go for a procedure, like a colonoscopy, right, doctors are looking for polyps. They're looking for abnormalities. And ideally, they identify them all, but they never do, because they look for them by visual inspection. And some are missed. And if that is a precancerous or a malignant polyp, it will spread very rapidly and create havoc. And so new AI-enabled technologies are reducing dramatically the number of polyps or other abnormalities that are missed in cancer detection. And my final proof point is around antibiotics. What you may or may not know is that we are seeing today one and a half million people die every year from antibiotic-resistant superbugs. So a superbug is a pathogen. That pathogen could be a virus or a bacteria that has grown so strongly that it no longer is effectively managed by an antibiotic. And so the World Health Organization tells us that we're on a course to see 10 million people die every year. 10 million people from these superbugs. And so here's a great case study just up the road at MIT. You see Dr. Jim Collins, the father of synthetic biology, who has been fighting the good fight in his lab for decades on trying to find new compounds that are effective against these, these superbugs. The golden age of antibiotic discovery happened in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. We're talking 60 to 80 years ago. That's a long time. He decides to collaborate with Dr. Regina Arziali, who was an AI specialist in biomedicine. And here's where the magic, you believe in magic? Here's some magic, okay? They wound up procuring a library of 110 million chemical compounds. It would have been impossible for them to analyze these 110 million compounds using the old techniques. But using a neural network in deep learning, they were able to identify an effective compound in three days, not three weeks, not three months, not three years, in three days. Okay? If that's not magic, I don't know what is. Okay? And we're just getting started. So let's now come full circle to these sustainable development goals. Okay? I think I made my case that at current course and speed, we will fail spectacularly. We cannot afford to wait a half a century. Every year that passes, the problems, the challenges, the crises become more complex and more severe, and the consequences become far more unthinkable. And so the question then I ask all of you is, how do we meet the moment? How do we rise to the occasion? What is it going to take for us to knock down these critical goals in some reasonable amount of time? And I think you know that my answer lies that at least part of it, and I'm not saying all of it, but part of it lies in embracing the power of AI. Now, I have lived in the tech industry. I've spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley and here in Boston and other tech centers. Right? What you need to know, whether you know this or not today, we are living in the era of AI today. And I realize some of you may not understand that. Some of you may even you know, be very skeptical. But what I want you to understand is the, the number of degrees of separation from this AI revolution epicenter you are, the less you may realize it today. But as sure as I'm standing here, I need you to go home and understand this. It's going to happen faster than you can imagine. And you want to be on the right side of this transformation. Okay? And so what, what would I like you to then take away from this discussion? First of all, it's all hands on deck for the planet. And as I look into the audience and so many students, right, this generation of students is the most environmentally and socially conscious since the 1960s. And you get it.
But for those of you who show up on a Saturday at a TEDx event on a day that feels like it's a monsoon day in Boston, we know that you all care about making the world a better place. And so what can you do? I would ask you to think about picking one of these 17 themes, one that you resonate with, one that makes your heart beat faster, and say, this is where I want to contribute. Okay? This is where I think I can make a difference. Because let's be honest, the government or the United Nations is incapable of helping us with this. Our US government can barely get from week to week without a shutdown crisis, okay? much less address some of these critical goals. So if you can think about that goal that makes you excited, do some research, figure out where and how you can contribute, I think that would be an incredible outcome. But don't do it with your hands tied behind your back. So as I travel the world today, teaching and lecturing and you know, doing all the things I do around AI, I have noticed this huge knowing doing gap. A lot of people have heard of generative AI. They know it's there. But most of them are not really rolling up their sleeves and using these tools. Okay? Why? I think it's probably very intimidating. But let's be clear, you don't have to be an AI specialist. You don't have to be a machine learning engineer. You don't have to be a data scientist. If you can speak or type, you can make these tools work for you. They're as intuitive and as accessible and as affordable as any tools with this level of power and capability that I have ever seen. Okay? So, let me talk about Singapore for a second. Singapore is a remarkable country that punches way above its weight. They have had a national AI policy in place since 2019, and they've already updated it. And one of the components of that policy is they are funding organizations and people to level up their skills. In self-reliant America, that is not going to happen. Okay? It is up to us. So what is on the other side of investing in your learning? a much higher level of productivity, a much higher quality of work, the ability to eliminate tedious tasks, and just like the doctor saving 20 hours of time a week, saving time for other things in your life. So what will you do with that extra time? Family, of course, taking care of your health, of course, learning an instrument or a new language, but I also hope that you will take some of that time once you get to the other side and you will dedicate it to making the planet a better place. Carpe diem.